Hey, this is Brooks with Character Design Forge. Welcome to the finale of Shopkeeper Month. If you're watching this, you're either a current or aspiring art shopkeeper, which is kind of a general term I'm using for someone who sells goods or services related to their art. This could be commissions, it could be products. It may just mean being a straight up employee or contractor. Now for the purposes of this video, I want you to think about a different kind of shopkeeper, a locksmith. Why does a locksmith stay in business? Well, the top two answers that I can think of are that they help people to open things that they're locked out of, and they help create copies of keys. So that will come in handy later. I wanna start out by saying in all sobriety that I am talking in this video from the place of my own experience, and I am not prescribing anything in particular or trying to rile you up like a puppy before you give it back to its owner. Mostly I'm talking from a lot of experience. Uh, I've tried a lot of things, done not so great on a few of them, and just generally have perspective where someone newer might not have perspective. I've also been collecting questions from you folks in the comments over the last few videos, which will weave into this discussion nicely. Okay, so back to the locksmith. What value is he providing? Copying keys, getting people back into things that they're locked out of, maybe doing things like replacing locks. But what if the thing that the locksmith is passionate about is selling his collection of curious vintage keys, or the sort of bizarre specialty custom keys that he makes himself? Well, the thing that people are going to come into his store for, probably 19 out of 20 times, if not more, is to get their problem fixed or their keys made. Because he's advertised himself as a locksmith, and because in general there's just going to be more people interested in that at first. He can try and build up a business selling old weird keys, but in general, more people want keys copied. If he wants to do the thing that will get him more money faster, he'll go where there's the demand. So if the analogy to art stuff wasn't super clear, it's basically the same thing. It's a much more straightforward path to make work for people, things like client work and commissions, than it is to create and sell products. Not saying that it isn't possible or viable or that people aren't doing a lot with them, but I'm telling you that even at the point uh, that I'm at with the audience that I have, it's been a long road to get to a place where products are what make up a big part of what I'm selling. And a lot of that is making new products regularly. All that to say products are a much more roundabout and longer process to make a success. And think about why, with that locksmith in mind, most people have a specific need or problem, a service that they needed his help with. Even if they came in and saw the display of cool old keys, they just aren't in the mindset or interested in that. Again, I'm not discouraging products, but I just thought I'd put that out there. People like to see things like fashion lines or brands and think that they can easily make a success too, when in reality there's tons of things like that and unsold inventory and failures for every one breakout success. Like we said last week, about 1-2% to of your audience online will buy products. If you have 100 followers, that means that hopefully one or two people will buy something. Now that might be great as something small on the side, but if you created and ordered the inventory for like 25 units, they aren't going to sell anytime soon, and you haven't broken even, let alone started sustaining yourself on product sales. The next thing that I just kind of have to say to semi-downer reality checks in a row. The majority of artists who get into trying to make art their work, whether it's products or client work, do it too early. And I'm probably guilty of this too. It's not like illegal or something, but when you're less experienced, your time is much better put into learning and growing so that your work will be desirable later. Last year, an artist made a simple Twitter thread essentially saying, hey, if you aren't getting work or clients, maybe it's because your work isn't up to par yet. And people got mad at that, at that rather reasonable and logical statement. I understand that it's sometimes hard to hear that in the moment. A lot of us are impatient to either do what we love more, to be legitimized by that professional qualifier, or to get out of work that we don't like. All of those are great motivating factors, but make sure that you're putting the work into improving. Because once you get busy with art-based work, your focus becomes efficiency and output, and not improvement, and your progress can then stagnate even more. People argued with that Twitter thread that there's other factors, and of course there are, when it comes to marketing yourself and privilege and networking, but those things should come secondary to the quality. Toxic and exhausting jobs are the worst. I won't discount that at all. Let's put that over here. I understand needing to find different work or changing your circumstances uh, should it be something that you need to do. 
but it just usually doesn't couple well with a transition into making art professionally unless you have the skills to back it up. A lot of people will look at someone like me and just uh, assume that I had it easy somehow or that this is all I've ever done, which it's definitely not. I've done like eight different kinds of construction, uh, electrical, heavy equipment work, worked for a race team, did sign making for the longest time. So jobs that are destroying you aside, again, it's over here, doing a thing that you aren't super jazzed about while you have to actually ends up leading to good creativity sometimes. Kind of like the sand that a shrimp turns into a pearl. You don't, you don't know that it's oysters. All right, fine, it's oysters. So let's say you make good stuff, but your audience or following is small. That's our first question from Leo Devon. How can you go about getting commissions? Well, one thing that I'd suggest here is to specialize on something that you're good at and approach a specific community that can use it. It's all about marketing here. So for instance, you go to the community of people that love to dress their chihuahuas up as astronauts. And instead of saying, I do drawing commissions, I can draw anything really, I'm a designer, an illustrator, I dabble in 3D. Instead of doing that, frame it in a way that makes sense to someone who doesn't know what a commission is and make it specific. So say, I will draw your chihuahua as an astronaut, $20 more for them to be in space, $40 more for them to be fighting an alien, something like that. Play to your strengths as far as what you make, not just this stupid chihuahua example. Trying to make the best art in a group of artists can be tough, so sometimes it helps to be the only artist in a group of Chihuahua Cosmos cosplayers. But don't be surprised if your worth or time isn't valued to people that don't understand what it takes to make art. That's a sort of unfortunate thing. The Messenger asks if it's a good idea to make up your own price for every piece of art that you finish. Say, I didn't really like how this drawing came out, so I'll charge less, or I love how this drawing came out, so it's worth every penny. I think that this is kind of a dangerous precedent. I, I don't know if the messenger is talking about, uh, say, a finished painting that you put up for sale, which would be a, a product, uh, versus something that's specifically made for someone that asked you to make it, so like a, a commission. You should be valuing your good work and maybe not even making your bad work available, kind of have a, a minimum quality threshold. What I'd hate to see is that you started giving out discounts to clients because they liked what you made just fine, but you weren't confident in it or a store with 10 okay paintings instead of a store with four great paintings. You really gotta respect yourself here. Confidence is really a key part in not just your own ability to do things well, but in how other people perceive how good your work is. So imagine if you watched a movie, really liked it, but then in an interview, all the director did was self-deprecate and point out all the flaws in their movie. That's not humble, it's just undercutting the quality. I'm definitely a prime suspect for talking through the character design process and where I have difficulties with it on this channel, but that's kind of the point of what that content is, and it's not how I would present work to a client. Mutt is asking, if you're good at both jam and umbrellas, how do you pick where to focus? Referring, of course, to the duality of sales over at Jamborellas. I feel like you already know in this case. There's one thing that you're definitely better at or where your heart is or the thing that you're more in demand as far as the market is concerned. You could be really into weaving shag carpets in the shape of ducks, but if artisan wooden spoons are selling more and you're trying to make one of those two things your livelihood, leave the other on the back burner for now and work at it over time. Man, the analogy meter is at absolute limit break already. Zynax, I think, asks about keeping commissions open instead of opening them monthly because they always get people who want to commission them, but they have to turn them down because they only choose to open monthly. So it seems like you've got artificial scarcity built into your business model and it's coming back to bite you. Most of the time when people only have commissions open for a certain amount of time, it's about filling in the slots that they are capable of fulfilling. So they're, they're literally budgeting their time for the month. So if they can only do 10 pieces in a month, they cap it off at 10. If you had the time to fulfill this commission that someone was reaching out to you for, but you were sort of peering back at them behind the, the closed sign in the window, flip that sign around. If you can consistently get too much demand and you can't fulfill all of these commissions, it's time to raise your price because that means that you're worth more. Marta Kiam is asking about getting things made by a service and asking specifically about Redbubble. Getting things made elsewhere is pretty standard. I don't make my own pins or trading cards even. And we talked last week about things like Redbubble and print-on-demand companies, how they're really generally wanting in quality. 
Azure Phoenix asks about how to determine your worth and your rate. Bare minimum, you want to account for your expenses and your labor. No one should be working under minimum wage doing art, and you should really be higher than that by a lot in the value. This is a skilled work, it took you time to learn, and especially when you're doing specialized work for someone else, that should come in a premium. So figure out what it costs to be you in a month, add some more to that to account for the extra work that it takes, uh, taxes, emails that you're sending and administrative stuff, some amount of savings, and divide that up by the amount of pieces that you can reasonably output or the hours that you can work in a month. If you end up saying, well, no one's going to pay me for that uh, because of uh, you know how good it is, it's not good enough yet, well, then it's about getting your skills in order like we talked about. Of course, easier said than done, but anything else is cart before the horse. Double Zero is asking essentially about how to get clients and jobs. First and foremost, put together a portfolio and make that easily available. Put your best work and the kind of work that you want to be doing in that portfolio. The two approaches from there are sort of like what we talked about with the Chihuahua astronauts. Seek out the place where there is a need or seek out art directors or studios and make your availability known to them. There's definitely a situation here where you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, but also expect to get a lot of either just either rejections or, you know, them saying we don't have a need right now from doing that. It's a long process to build up a client base, and sometimes it takes a while to get a job just the same. Weiss is basically asking for a rule of thumb on pricing products. Make sure that you factor the time that it took to develop the product into the price, but the rule of thumb is uh, that a lot of people try to use is that it should be at least double the cost it took to make uh, so that you have a little bit of room for profit and administrative and, and all the legwork. Pricing is a science though on its own and something where supply and demand comes into play as well. Goodall is asking if it's possible to jump the gun, which we've talked a bit about already. Yes, it is. But another avenue that we haven't talked about much, mostly because things have been changing and it's been impossible during COVID, but you can also try and make inroads at conventions or at stores. There you can get that in-person advantage, but remember how much business is done online these days. GSV Productions is kind of asking about suppliers specifically. You want to look for someone who can do high quality runs and generally since you're starting out at low quantities. Not every print shop or service has low minimums. I would suggest first of all looking in your local area for print shops and seeing how they do. I don't have a supplier for prints that I've used recently so I can't really point you towards someone specifically. It's worth a Google. And finally, Haywire asks first about how to decide what kinds of products to make and somewhat related as far as my answer is concerned, tips for tabling at conventions. So I'd say the same way that you can write a story with one person in mind, make products for a particular person or group of people in mind. Of course, you're going to make whatever you're most excited or passionate about, but make sure there's some kind of running theme or through line to it, almost like a, an aesthetic or, or narrative. Even like we talked about with stickers, make sure there's value to the person who would want it beyond it just being the thing that you thought it'd be cool to make. And tabling at conventions is actually in the same ballpark as this. It's just a, a much more streamlined version of it. I think the best booths are the ones that are focused, where you can understand what someone's about or what they're offering, almost like there's a little bit of theater or storytelling going on. If you simply have a booth with 20 different kinds of products, some of it fan art, some of it original, some of it comic art, some of it hand painted, it's almost like you're hoping something will stick by throwing all of that at people at once. But if there's focus, you may not attract all people to buy from you, which you never will, but you're more likely to capture the people that are interested in what you want to make. So for me, I'm not going to capture the superhero comic fans or NASCAR aficionados, and that's okay. I've got this vibe of delightful characters and I'm sticking to it, and people that are prone to like that will grasp what I'm about a lot easier. One of my favorite booth designs was Amber Aki Huang, who instead of having the sort of traditional animation artist display, had some vertical banners in her style of like bread and a bakery behind her, and all of the supporting elements of the booth kind of fit the theme and aesthetic. It set the scene for her work, which has that cozy baked bread atmosphere to it. I think there's a lot of thinking that can go into how you present your work that's not just putting everything that you've ever done in front of people all at once. That goes for booths and stuff online. If anything I've said in this video ends up being discouraging in any way, just understand that the path of least resistance for someone in my position 
as I've seen it wielded way too often before, is to encourage people to do things before they're ready to when it comes to business. It rings of get rich quick, and I'm just a little allergic to that. What I'm recommending here is, again, in my experience, a sustainable, long-term way to maneuver this stuff without destroying yourself or losing time and money unnecessarily. It's a tough thing to navigate, but it's by no means impossible. Just have some patience with yourself. With that, we'll flip the open sign back over to closed on Shopkeeper Month. And while this video was really the chance to get your question and I'll do my best if you still have a few in the comments below. What do you think of themed months in the future and what themes would you like to see explored? It's the last chance to get July's Biko's Backpack featuring these two lovely shopkeepers over on patreon.com slash bageldenizen and my course Learn Character Design is over at learncharacterdesign.com. Here's a very sardonic logic puzzle for you. If art professors at art schools are using my free videos during their class time, which people paid for, wouldn't it be better to spend a lot less money on my course, which is my stuff, but but premium? That's that's for you to decide. You can follow me at Bagel Denizen over on Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, and TikTok. Oh, and one more thing. Probably talk about this again in the future because I want to get John back on the channel for another video. We actually have a, a fun idea. He's just been super busy with client work, so we keep pushing it off a little bit. But his new book, Hugo Sprouts and the Strange Case of the Beans, is out. Uh, it's lovely, it's delightful, and it's it's beautiful. Uh, John wrote and, and illustrated the whole thing. It's available on Amazon or through Harper Collins Publishing. Yeah, their website. Grab that. Do do John Lauren a favor. It's beautiful work, and I thought I'd just mention that. Thanks so much for watching, and have fun creating.